It's all been building to this. Maya Govan and Melanina Menik Swilaid. My name's Remo Dave, and welcome to the final episode in our Lords of Beleriand First Age Silmarillion series. And guys, in this video, I am going to talk about one of the most especially awe-inspiring moments in the entire Legendarium. In fact, when I first decided to make a YouTube series all about the Silmarillion, this was one of the moments that I was most excited to talk about. Because from previous videos, you'll know that in the 395 years since the Dagor Aglareb, the glorious battle, where Morgoth was locked away and besieged beneath his fortress of Angband, there's been a really long peace throughout all of Beleriand. The elves and the newly arrived men have had centuries of opportunity and prosperity, and they've built all these new kingdoms and learned to thrive in the lands of Beleriand. But Morgoth was not destroyed in the Dagor Aglareb. He was besieged, but not beaten. And in the nearly four centuries that have followed, Morgoth has been building the largest and deadliest army of evil things that Middle-earth has seen yet. But just before we get into the unleashing of that army, I do want to take a moment to talk about the hero of this video, and also one of the main heroes of the story so far. Fien Golfin, High King Fien Golfin, the half-brother of Feanor, the guy who led the Noldor through the treacherous Hel Caraxe, and in my mind, the greatest High King that the Noldor have ever known. And during the long siege of Angband, Fien Golfin was one of the few elven lords that did not grow complacent. We were specifically told that he perceived the danger they were living in, and he pondered once more an assault upon Angband. He knew that as long as the circle of the siege was incomplete, Morgoth was free to labour, devising what evils none could foretell. But, tragically for all involved, Fingolfin's warnings went, for the most part, unheeded as the other Nolduin lords were unwilling to risk their lives in what they considered a pointless battle. And to be fair to the other Nolduin lords, I can kind of see where they're coming from. You know, if the elves were to challenge Morgoth and to reignite the war, many must surely perish were it in victory or in defeat. And during the long peace, the land was fair and their kingdoms wide. So why risk it all to fight a tyrant god who's not even really actively a problem right now? And in this philosophy, the sons of Feanor were the worst offenders, particularly the three C's, Kelegorm, Kurufin, and Caranthir, the bad ones. But we're actually told that of the Lords of the North, only Angrod and Iagnor shared Fingolfin's desire to press their advantage. And that's because the lands of Angrod and Iagnor are Dorthonian. These would be the first lands to come under attack if the Dark Lord did ever break the siege, so the threat of Morgoth was present to their thought. Also, Angrod and Aignor are two of the Noldor's top warriors, so it makes sense that they would want to fight. But unfortunately, I guess with the benefit of hindsight, Fingolfin's plans never did come into fruition, and so instead of challenging Morgoth, they simply kept up the siege. They built hill forts and watchtowers right on Morgoth's doorstep, and the Dark Lord's evil was buried away so deep that a grassy meadow called Arid Galen grew all the way up to the very gates of Angband. But Morgoth had long prepared his force in secret, while ever the malice of his heart grew greater. And he desired not only to end his foes, but to destroy also and defile the lands that they had taken and made fair. And right here, we actually see one of Morgoth's great weaknesses. You see, we're told that if Morgoth had endured to wait just a little bit longer, and let his armies grow just a little bit stronger, then the Noldor would have perished utterly. But Morgoth's hatred overcame his counsel, and luckily he underestimated his enemies. He esteemed too lightly the valour of the elves, and very importantly, of men he took yet no account. So, it was on a cold night in the middle of winter, when night was dark and without moon, 
that the vigilance of the elves was at its weakest. And it was at this time that Morgoth unleashed his first assault in hundreds of years. But it did not begin with orcs, nor with werewolves, nor with balrogs. It began with fire. Tolkien writes that suddenly Morgoth sent forth great rivers of flame, and the mountains of iron belched forth fires of many poisonous hues, and just like that, the siege of Angband was broken. The green meadow perished, the grass of Arid Gallon became a burned and desolate waste, barren and lifeless. And forever after, this green meadow of Ard Gallon was renamed Anfauglith, the gasping dust. Hundreds of the Noldor died instantly in this eruption, and many charred bones had there their roofless grave. Those that survived fled to high ground and came to seek shelter either behind the mountains in Fingolfin's realm of Hithlum or in the highland forests of Dorthonion. And thus began the fourth great battle of Beleriand, the Dagor Bragolach, the Battle of Sudden Flame. So, as I said a moment ago, the strategically placed realm of Dorthonion was the first to come under attack by Morgoth's army. But before even a single orc set foot there, the flames of the Thangorodrim came in fiery torrents, and the trees upon the slopes of Dorthonion were kindled, and the smoke wrought confusion amongst the defenders. Now, I will just take a moment to remind you all who's living in, and thus who's defending, Dorthonion at this time, because it is primarily inhabited by two very different groups of people. The Elven Realm is ruled by two great Elven warrior princes, that's Angrod and Iagnor, and they are the younger brothers of Finrod Felagund and the older brothers of Galadriel. And we're not explicitly told how many elven warriors they had behind them, but they are vassals of Finrod Felagund, and they're defending one of the most strategically important places in Beleriand, so I think we can assume that the elves of Dorthonion were at least a formidable group. But elves aren't the only people living here. If you remember from the Edine episode, Dorthonion is also home to the men of the House of Baor, the elf friends who swore undying loyalty to the House of Finrod. And by the time of the Dagor Bragolach, the chieftain of the men of the House of Baor was a guy called Bregolas. Now, Bregolas is not the most important man in Middle-earth, but he is the patriarch of a very important family. One of Bregolas's granddaughters will go on to be the mother of the famous children of Hurin, and his other granddaughter is the grandmother of the massively important character Eärendil, and thus the great-grandmother of Elrond himself. And Bregolas also has a very important brother, but I'll talk about him in just a moment. However, unfortunately for Bregolas, it was his destiny to lead the House of Baor in their defense of Dorthonion. And in this battle, Bregolas was slain, along with a great part of the warriors of that people. Tolkien tells us that Morgoth unleashed in the front of that fire Glaurung the Golden, father of dragons in his full might, and in his train were Balrogs and behind them came the black armies of the orcs, in multitudes such as the Noldor had never before seen or imagined. Now, I can speculate that Angrod and Aignor put up an incredible fight, but against a force like that, there can be no victory. Tolkien doesn't really give us many details, but he tells us that both Angrod and Aignor were slain, and Dorthonion eventually fell to the might of Morgoth's army. The Highland Forest was conquered by evil things, and it swiftly fell under shadow. Forever after Dorthonion was renamed Tower Nufuin, the forest under nightshade. And Tower Nufuin became a wild and dangerous place where evil things bred and roamed freely. And so, in the opening days of this battle, the first elven kingdom of the north has already fallen. 
And I think it is worth pointing out that although the Dagor Bragolach is referred to as a battle, it isn't just like a one day thing or even a two day thing. After the breaking of the siege of Angband, we are told that there was never again peace in Beleriand. War never ceases from this moment on. But the breaking of the siege took place in midwinter and Tolkien himself states that the Dagor Bragolach doesn't officially end until the coming of spring. So this really is more of like a war within a war than it is a single battle. It goes on for months. Anyway, just a moment ago I mentioned the brother of Bregolas and with Bregolas dead, he is now the rightful chieftain of what remains of the House of Baor. And Bregolas's brother is called Barahir. Now, Barahir is a name that you guys have almost certainly heard before, as it's his name that's given to the famous ring of Barahir that will much later become a symbol of the Dúnedain and eventually it will pass to Aragorn before he gives it as a wedding gift to Arwen. You can even see him wearing the ring in the movies. But the story of that ring and the reason it becomes known as the Ring of Barahir begins 6,955 years before the Lord of the Rings with this very battle. So while Angrod, Iagnor and Bregolas were dying in Dorthonion, word reached the hidden realm of Nargothrond that the Highlands were under attack. And so Angrod and Iagnor's brother, Fenrod Felagund, mustered his warriors and marched north to lend aid. Although we all know he was too late. But it was right here by the Fen of Serech that the Noldorian army of Nargothrond under Fenrod Felagund met up with Barahir and his warriors of the House of Baal that were now fighting just into the west of Dorthonion. Now, if you aren't super familiar with archaic words like fen, which is probably pretty normal, according to the dictionary, it means a marshy bog that's prone to flooding. And so a fen in winter must be a particularly nasty place to be fighting a battle. And the battle at the fen of Serech goes particularly badly for the elves of Fenrod Felagund. We are told that they are completely cut off from their allies and surrounded by a multitude of orcs. There are two elven brothers of Nargothrond who are specifically named in the Silmarillion, they are Gwyndor and Gelmir, and Gelmir especially has a really rough time of it in this battle. He's captured by orcs and later taken alive as their prisoner back to Angband, where he's tortured and eventually blinded. Now, we will see both Gelmir and especially his brother Gwyndor again in the story when I talk about the children of Húrin, but I think it's fair to say that all the suffering those two brothers go through begins with this disastrous battle at the Fen of Serech. In fact, we're even told that Fenrod Felagund himself would have been slain or taken, but he was luckily spared from that fate by the intervention of Barahir and his warriors of the House of Baor. So in previous videos I've already said that the House of Baor are incredibly loyal to their patron saint, I say in air quotes, and in this battle they prove it beyond any possible doubt. Barahir and the bravest of his men made a wall of spears about Fenrod Felagund and they cut their way out of the battle with great loss. And after this, the House of Beor are almost extinct. Barahir does survive along with a handful of his men, but forever after they live a scattered life as outlaws in the lands of Morgoth. Never again in Beleriand will the House of Beor have a homeland. I mean, some of their women and children do flee into the lands of Fenigolfin as refugees, but the Dagor Bragolach truly does bring ruin to this great clan of men. But the heavy sacrifice of the House of Beor does pay off in the end. Due to Barahir's bravery, Fenrod Felagund escapes the Fen, and along with that elf Gwyndor and the other survivors of his army, he returns to the secret realm of Nargothrond to live to fight another day. But before Fenrod leaves Barahir on the battlefield, he removes a ring from his finger. A ring that was forged and fashioned by the great Noldorin smiths of Valinor before the creation of the sun. And he gave this ring 
to Barahir. The Ring of Felagun forever afterwards became known as the Ring of Barahir, and it was more than just a gift. It was a token of a vow. Fenrod swore to Barahir an oath of abiding friendship that would extend to all of his kin throughout all the ages of Fenrod's life. And this battle-forged friendship between Felagund and Barahir will be absolutely crucial in the next series of videos I make where we'll talk all about Beren and Luthien. So remember Barahir, remember his ring, and remember that unbreakable alliance which now exists between his kin and Lord Fenrod Felagund. Anyway, on the other side of Beleriand, the Dagor Bragolak was still very much raging. We're told that in the east, the war had gone ill with the sons of Feanor, and well nigh all the east marches were taken by assault. And the first of these sons to be beaten were the despicable duo Kelegorm and Kurufin, aka the worst two. So Kelegorm and Kurufin lived in Himlad, which is right here in the northeast. But when the pass of Aglon fell, Kelegorm and Kurifin fled all the way into the southwest, and they came to seek sanctuary in Nargothrond with Finrod Felagund. So they fled a really long way. And I think there's something quite telling here about Kelegorm and Kurifin, as Tolkien gives us a snarkily foreboding sentence. He says it would have been better if they had remained in the east. So. Just like Barahir, Kelegorm and Kurufin will become a lot more important when we get to Beren and Luthien, but for now I'll just say that the two sons of Feanor bring their warriors to Nargothrond and they reinforce the strength of Fenrod Felagund, but they also bring a really negative energy to an otherwise really lovely place. Nargothrond deserves better than Kelegorm and Kurufin. Anyway, speaking of disappointing sons of Feanor whose name begins with a C, Caranthir doesn't fare a whole lot better in the Dagor Bragolach. So Caranthir is the lord of Thargelion, and this land is ravaged by orcs. We're told they came with fire and terror, and that Lake Helavorn was defiled. But instead of joining his older brothers Mythros and Maglor upon the hill of Himring, Caranthir fled into the south, taking his youngest brothers Amrod and Amras with him. And Caranthir and the twins also flee a really long way. They pass Ramdal and they set up a watchtower on Amon Ereb. And although they do participate in future events, to be honest, Caranthir does sit out a good deal of the conflict from this point forward. He just kind of chills out with the green elves of Assyrian, right down here in the summery south where Morgoth's orcs don't go. But not all the sons of Feanor flee from the Dagor of Bragolach, and one of them performed deeds of surpassing valour. Maedhros the Tall, the eldest, in my mind the most interesting. So Maedhros has already done a few important things in this story. He was Feanor's firstborn, so he was technically the High King of the Noldor for a very, very, very short while. But then he was captured by Morgoth and chained to the sheer precipice of the Thangorodrim for 24 years, until his cousin Fingon cut off his hand and rescued him. After that, Maedhros yielded the kingship to his uncle Finigolfin, and he came to dwell in the ever-cold northeast of Beleriand, waiting for a chance to settle his score with the Dark Lord. And we're told that in the 451 years since Maedhros' imprisonment, he has trained and trained and trained so that he lived to wield his sword with the left hand more deadly than his right had been. And in the Dagor Bragolach, Maedhros was so fierce that orcs fled before his face. For since his torment upon Thangorodrim, his spirit burned like white fire within. So, Maedhros is an absolute badass. He built his fortress upon this hill of Himring with the specific purpose of standing against Morgoth and preventing him from ever wholly conquering the east. And what's so cool about this is that I've just talked about how Thargelion and Lake Helavorn were ravaged and defiled, but we're explicitly told by Tolkien Himring could not be taken. 
So, throughout the battle, Myathros remained in his great fortress as a bastion of resistance against the Orc hordes. He inspired the courage of his most valiant defenders, and he was soon joined by his dearest brother Maglor, the second son of Feanor. In fact, Himring became a shelter for the refugee elves and men of Dorthonion. It was a refuge in the middle of a war zone. But that's not even it. When enough people had rallied there to Mythros, he rode out and actually closed up the Pass of Aglon. He fought so hard that he successfully prevented the orcs from entering Eastern Beleriand via that route. However, as all of you'll know, there was more to Morgoth's army than orcs, and a significant amount of the sudden flame for which this battle is named came from Glaurung, the father of dragons. And when Glaurung, now fully grown, led a force of orcs and balrogs through Maglor's Gap, which isn't labelled on this map but it's right here, they destroyed all the land between the arms of Gelion. Maglor and his riders were forced to retreat back to Himring, and many were burned alive by the dragon's fire upon the empty plain of Lothlan. And so, just like Dorthonion in the middle, East Beleriand also fell to the power of Morgoth. But there is a very cool fun fact here, because although the northeast of Beleriand is pretty much overrun by evil things, Myathros's fortress upon the hill of Himring, that never falls. And I don't want to get too sidetracked by a tangent, but Himring actually endures longer than pretty much any other place in Beleriand. I don't want to spoil the end of the First Age, but I feel like most of you will know, or you'll have noticed, that by the time of the Lord of the Rings, most of Beleriand no longer exists. Like, the whole region is literally flooded by ocean, except for Himring. If we look at a map of Middle-earth from the time of the Lord of the Rings, that's the end of the Third Age, we won't see anywhere called Nargothrond or Doriath or Gondolin, but we do still see the Hill of Himring, or rather the Island of Himring as it will by then be known. And I just think it's really, really cool that Mythros put so much of himself into resisting Morgoth in the First Age and withstanding his assaults that even the Apocalypse itself is not enough to destroy his stronghold. I think it's a really wonderful detail. Anyway, I began this video by talking about Fien Golfin, and really, the Dagor Bragolach is his story. So, let's move away from the east now and take a look at the northwesterly kingdom of the High King, Heathlum. And within Heathlum, there are two significant regions. Mithrim, which is the capital of Fingolfin's kingdom, and Dorlomin, the land that used to belong to his son Fingon, but now belongs to the mighty men of the House of Hador. And at the time of the Dagor Bragolach, the chieftain of the House of Hador is still Hador Lorindel himself, one of the greatest mannish heroes of the First Age, a peer of elven lords and also one of Fingolfin's dearest friends. So, I mentioned earlier that after the scorching of Ardgallon and the ruin of Dorthonion, many of the Noldor's allies, including Sindar elves and a significant number of men, fled over the Ered Wethrim, that's the Mountains of Shadow, and they came to Fingolfin's lands as refugees. But this did not mean they were out of danger. Morgoth sent a vast onslaught of orcs against Heathlum, and their numbers were so great that Fingolfin and his army were entirely sundered from their allies by a sea of foes. But Heathlum remained unconquered, and that is due in part to the valour of High King Fingolfin, and also the valour of his beloved ally, the greatest chieftain of the Edine, Hador Lorindel. So, the main western sphere of the Dagor Bragolach was fought here, at Fingolfin's Noldorine fortress of Barad Eithel. And it's here that after fierce fighting, the Noldor were driven back with great loss. But the fortress held, and that is thanks to Hador and the warriors of his house. Before the walls of Barad Eithel, Hador Lorindel fought hard, defending the rearguard of his lord, Fingolfin. 
Barad Aethel did not fall, and all of Heathlum remained untouched by the armies of Morgoth. In fact, we're told that the bravery of the men and elves of the North was so great that neither Orc nor Balrog could yet overcome, and Heathlum remained a threat upon the flank of Morgoth's attack, a powerful elven realm right next to Morgoth's newly acquired lands in the North. But Heathlum's defence came at a hefty price. Before the walls of Barad Aethel, Hador Lorindel was killed. His youngest son was killed also, and presumably no small number of his warriors too. And in an earlier video, I compared the relationship between Fine Golfin and Hador to that of a loving master and his faithful dog. You know, Fine Golfin always knew that Hador would die before him, such is the nature of a mortal befriending an immortal, but when Hador and his son were killed by orcs, I think it's fair to say, I mean, considering what Fine Golfin does next, that he was particularly devastated. So, when news came to Finigolfin that his nephews Angrod and Iagnor had also been killed in this battle, and that Dorthonion had fallen and most of East Beleriand had fallen too, he was filled with wrath and despair, and he perceived that the utter ruin of the Noldor had come. But Fingolfin is not the kind of guy to go out with a whimper. He was pissed off, and so he decided to do the most badass thing imaginable. Seriously, I honestly think Fingolfin's response to the disaster of the Dagor Bragolak is perhaps the single most awesome thing that any character ever does in Tolkien's entire Legendarium. I mean, obviously, there's a huge amount of competition for that distinction, but this is one of the most unbelievably epic parts of the entire Legendarium. So, Fingolfin gets on his horse, a horse called Rochalor, and he rode forth alone, passing over the scorched and foul like wind amid the dust. All the orcs that beheld him fled in amaze, for a great madness of rage was upon him, so that his eyes shone like the eyes of the Valar. In fact, Morgoth's servants mistake Fingolfin for the Valar Orame himself, the Lord of the Hunt. And this is interesting, because in The Return of the King, King Theoden is also compared to Orame, a god of old, during his charge before the Battle of Pelennor Fields. And I think there is a, a fairly salient comparison between these two kings in these two moments. I mean, obviously Theoden had an army behind him, whereas Fingolfin charged alone, but they're both riding with wrath into a battle they know they can't win. But they ride anyway. And Fingolfin, with the wrath of the Valar shining in his eyes, came alone to Angband's gates, and he sounded his horn and challenged Morgoth to come forth to single combat. Now, honestly, I reckon that in this moment, Morgoth must have realised that he'd probably gone a little bit too far with this whole Dagor Bragolak thing. I mean, Fingolfin is only one elf, but even so, Morgoth, alone of the Valar, new fear. He did not want to accept Fingolfin's challenge, and at first he doesn't. But Fingolfin's voice came keen and clear down into the depths of Angband. He called Morgoth Craven and Lord of Slaves, and with his captains watching him, Morgoth had no choice but to accept the challenge. And so, it's right here that Tolkien gives us the most iconic three-word sentence in the entire Silmarillion. And Morgoth came. We're given an incredible description of the Dark Lord that I'm going to have to read word for word as Tolkien's use of language in this scene is incredible. He writes that Morgoth issued forth clad in black armour. And he stood before the king like a tower, iron crowned, and his vast shield cast a shadow over him like a storm cloud. But Fingolfin gleamed beneath it as a star, for his mail was overlaid with silver, and his blue shield was set with crystals, and he drew his sword Ringil that glittered like ice. 
Which brings us to the most epic one-on-one -on -one battle in, uh, in all of fiction. I mean, that might be a bit of a bold claim, but in my mind, yeah. The most epic duel in all of fiction. And it's made even more special by the fact that this duel is the final time that Morgoth ever emerges from Angband. The injuries that Fingolfin inflict upon Morgoth cripple him for the rest of his time in the universe. So, we know that Fingolfin's weapon is the icy sword Ringil, but Morgoth's weapon is even more iconic. It's something you've almost certainly heard of, even if you've never read the Silmarillion, because Morgoth fights with a mighty mace called Grond, the Hammer of the Underworld. The same Grond that the famous Battering Ram will eventually be named after in the Third Age. Now, we're told that Morgoth swung Grond down like a bolt of thunder, but he missed. Fingolfin sprang aside, and instead of hitting the Elven King, Gron struck the ground and rent a mighty pit when smoke and fire darted. Each time Morgoth attacked, Fingolfin leapt away as lightning shoots from under a dark cloud. And seven times Fingolfin landed a hit, seven wounds he inflicted on the Dark Lord, and seven cries of anguish came from Morgoth. We're told that the hosts of Angban fell upon their faces in dismay, which honestly I find kind of hilarious. You know, Morgoth has a heck of a reputation for being like the ultimate big bad, but the truth is he fights one duel and he doesn't do particularly well in it, considering he's not only a god, but supposedly he used to be the mightiest of all the Ainur. It must seem pretty embarrassing from the perspective of his servants, like this is the guy we're working for? Anyway. Eventually, Fingolfin grew weary, but the fight was not yet over. He was crushed to his knees three times by Morgoth, but three times he arose again. However, due to all the times that Grond missed its mark, the ground beneath Fingolfin's feet was now rent and pitted about him, and eventually Fingolfin stumbled and fell backwards into one of these pits. Morgoth brought his foot down upon Fingolfin's neck, which we're told felt like the weight of a fallen hill. But with the last of his strength, Fingolfin took up Ringil, and he shewed the Dark Lord's foot. Morgoth's blood gushed black and smoking and filled the pits of Grond. And Tolkien explicitly states that Morgoth went ever halt of one foot after that day, and the pain of his wounds could not be healed. So basically, Fingolfin crippled Morgoth forever. But he gave his life to do it. In a fiery pit that was torn open by the hammer of the underworld, Fingolfin died, the most proud and valiant of the elven kings of old. And although Fingolfin technically lost the duel, his sacrifice proved to the Noldor that Morgoth is not invulnerable. After dying, Fingolfin's soul, his Thea would have travelled west, and it would have been held and judged in the halls of Mandos. But Fingolfin was a good elf. He wasn't perfect, but he was never cruel, and he was never malicious, and so I'm pretty sure in time his Thea would be released from the halls of Mandos, and it would be rehoused in a new body. He would get a new life to live in Valinor where his wife Anaire was waiting for him, where his brother Finarfin ruled as the High King of the Noldor in the West. By contrast, Morgoth suffered seven permanent wounds plus a crippling injury to his foot, and all his captains and servants were right there watching it happen. And we're told afterwards, the orcs made no boast of that duel. Even they have the wits to understand that although Fingolfin lost the fight, it's hard to argue Morgoth won it. And honestly, that's not even the end of the Dark Lord's bad day. You see, because Morgoth is, oh, well, he's just the absolute worst, isn't he? He sucks beyond belief. He took the body of the Elven King and broke it and would cast it to his wolves, but he is denied that opportunity. So we're told that he heard the sound of the rushing of wings like the noise of the winds of Manwe. And remember, Manwe is not only the king of all Ardo and the lord of the winds and skies, he's also the brother of Morgoth. 
Now, as awesome as it would be if Manwe really did appear and beat up Morgoth in this moment, the Valar of the West are forbidden from interfering in the fate of the Noldor, so he can't do that. But what he does do is send his mightiest servant to bear Fingolfin's body to safety. And this servant is Thorondor, the king of all eagles. Now, we've seen Thorondor before. He is, of course, the eagle who helped Fingon rescue Mithros from the Fangorod Ream. And if you want to learn more about him and his kin, then check out this video all about the Great Eagles once this one's finished. I actually go into quite a lot of detail on Thorondor's role in this very scene, where we are told he swooped down on Morgoth and marred his face. But as I said in that Eagles video, marred his face seems like a bit of an understatement. We're told elsewhere that Thorondor has a wingspan of 30 fathoms. That's 55 meters or 180 feet. About the same height as like the Leaning Tower of Pisa or even the Cinderella Castle at Disney World. Now the reason this is significant is that an average real world golden eagle has a wingspan of about 2 meters and they have talons that are about 6 centimeters long. So if we make this 27 and a half times larger, we'll get an eagle that's roughly the same size as Thorondor and his talons would thus be 1.65 meters long. That's taller than the average woman. So just imagine that. Imagine being Morgoth. You've already suffered seven wounds and your foot is permanently crippled, but then, just when you think the fight is finally over, a colossal eagle swoops down and with eight talons, each one as long as a person, he tears up your face. Just think how painful that would be, and then remember just how utterly Morgoth deserves it. Anyway, as I've already said, after this day, Morgoth never again leaves the safety of Angband or the Thangorodrim. For the rest of the First Age, he remains locked away, kind of like a coward. And I know that it's very easy to think of Morgoth as being some awe-inspiring ultimate being, and perhaps a long time ago Melkor truly was. But honestly, after the Dagor Bragolach, Morgoth has learned the meaning of pain. He learned it from Fingolfin, and the wounds of Ringil and Thorondor will follow him forever after. But before I finish this video and this whole series, I do want to go back to Fingolfin for the final time. Because Thorondor carries Fingolfin's body far away from the gates of Angband and up into the mountains where the great eagles keep their eyries. And it just so happens that beneath these mountains lies the concealed plain where the elven hidden city of Gondolin had secretly been built. And the guy who built Gondolin is, of course, Fingolfin's second son, a guy we've not seen in quite some time, Turgon. But despite Turgon's disappearance from the narrative, he does briefly return to the story at this moment to build a high cairn over his father's grave. And thus, Fingolfin's tomb is set upon a high mountain in a hidden place where no orc dared ever after to pass. And the Elf King's body remained there forever, overlooking the secret city of his second son. And so, where do we go from here? With Fingolfin gone, the High Kingship of the Noldor passes to the next generation, the grandchildren of Finwë, as they're the only lords of the Noldor left. When Thorondor told the Elves of Heathlum what had become of their High King, there was great lamentation, but I think the sorrow was felt most dearly by Fingolfin's firstborn, Fingon. For in sorrow, Fingon took the lordship of the House of Fingolfin and the kingdom of the Noldor. And we'll see as the story progresses that Fingon is a very worthy king. He's an excellent ruler, but times are harder for him than they were for his father. Fingon is alone, sundered from his cousins by a swarming sea of orcs. And that's the Beleriand that we're left with in a post Fingolfin world. The story has shifted. Northern Beleriand no longer belongs to the Noldor. I mean, there are pockets of resistance, but throughout much of Beleriand, orcs roam freely. 
the first age is about to get a lot darker. But all hope is not lost. Remember, Morgoth failed to completely destroy his enemies in the Dagor Bragolak because he made no account of men. He just didn't believe that they could be a threat, and that arrogance will cost him again. Because. In the ruined realm of Angrod and Iagnor, Dorthonion is no more. The armies of Morgoth dwell and multiply in Tower Nufuin, but the men who once lived there, the House of Baor who fought alongside the brothers of Finrod, they do not abandon their home. Barahir and all that remains of the House of Baor stay in Tower Nufuin as outlaws, hunting the servants of the enemy. And among this small band of outlaws is Barahir's 23-year-old son, a man called Beren, the mortal man who is destined to fall in love with the immortal Luthien Tinuviel. And guys, together, Beren and Luthien are going to change the world. So, that's the story I'll tell in the next First Age series, the epic tale of Beren and Luthien. And I'm afraid to say I can't tell you exactly when that new series will come out, but I promise it will come out. But until then, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and the whole series. And if you did, don't forget to hit like and subscribe and leave a comment if you want to. Next week, I think I will release one more lore video, but after that, I may have to take a bit of a break to make more videos. So, until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Nevaya Melanine.